Hi, we'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for public transit agencies. Uh, I'm Terry Bills and I'm the Transportation Industry Manager here at ESRI. And today we're joined by uh, David Wasserman, Carrie Carcel, and Marshall Ballard, all from uh, Fear and Peers. Uh, so we're very fortunate actually to have them uh, with us today to present some of their recent work, uh, highlighting the intersection of land use, transportation, and public transit demand planning. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, we are recording this webinar, and while everyone will be on mute, uh, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. So you can type your questions into the question box, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Uh, additionally, the slides, which are part of uh, today's webinar, will be available to you on the GeoNet group uh, departments of Transportation, and uh, as well as then this uh, uh, webinar recording will be up on the website within uh, roughly three or four days uh, in case you want to direct a uh, colleague to uh, to the webinar. Um, so uh, let me uh, start off by uh, reiterating, I guess, that uh, solving our mobility issues is probably the central challenge uh, for most cities. Oops around the around the world let's uh, not sure what uh, um, and uh, prior to the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 most cities were experiencing uh, increasing levels of congestion uh, and struggling to understand how to effectively uh, coordinate the disparate elements uh, of the changing mobility in, in their cities so um, with the proliferation of uh, various forms of micromobility, TNCs, and the growth of pickup and delivery services, uh, the, the mobility landscape of most cities uh, was uh, rapidly changing. Um, as all of you are uh, unfortunately uh, painfully aware, COVID-19 has drastically altered uh, this discussion for the moment. Uh, transit demand has largely collapsed in, in uh, many cities and there's now a lively debate about uh, how the coronavirus may actually change the shape of uh, cities in the future. Uh, at the same time, uh, I do think that uh, many public transit agencies are really grappling with not only how do they return to some type of uh, uh, new normal, but perhaps looking even more deeply at what types of services would be the most effective uh, in our urban environments and perhaps how to uh, reinvent or even reimagine their services. Um, all of these questions revolve around having uh, good data to understand these changes and understanding uh, how those land use impacts uh, uh, our uh, transportation systems and demand. So to help us look at those questions, let me turn it over uh, to uh, Marshall and at Fear and Peers. And uh, so Marshall, take it away. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so my name is Marshall Ballard. I'm a Fear and Peers employee in the San Jose office. I'm an interdisciplinary geographer and uh, transportation planner. And my name is David Wasserman. I'm a uh, transportation planner, data scientist based out of uh, the Seattle office of Baron Pierce. And I'm Carrie Carcel. I'm an associate out of the Roseville, California office and acting GIS manager. So I wanna just start uh, and give a little bit of background about Farron Pierce. So since 1985, we've been a trusted community partner serving as a multimodal transportation planning and engineering consulting firm. You know, at Fair and Peers, uh, we will transform transportation consulting as the most trusted partner in the communities we serve. Our mission is to empower every employee to develop effective and innovative transportation solutions that improve communities. And we're gonna share some of those projects that we've done just that uh, with, with you today. So today's agenda, we're going to walk you through uh, mobility policy, planning, and programming. Uh, share with you some multimodal data sets and dashboards. 
we are going to uh, walk you through vehicle miles traveled evaluation and geospatial criteria tool and, and include a live demonstration of that. And then discuss a few uh, next steps uh, before we enter a question uh, and answer period. So I thought the best thing to do would be to kind of just provide an overarching definition of mobility for everybody. And really, in my opinion, it comes into two facets. And it's quality, state of being, uh, mobile or movable. And it's also uh, the ability to change one's social uh, or socioeconomic position in the community, uh, especially to uh, improve it. You know, our traditional mobility modes, as Terry had kind of prefaced for us and with car, transit, bus and rail, uh, bicycle and foot are now transitioning into uh, smart mobility modes, which are most often app enabled with e-scooters, e-bikes, ride sharing, car sharing, ride hailing, and also e-commerce and, and deliveries. So this shift in mobility has drastically changed our ability to provide access to opportunity and further an analyze multimodal accessibility. As we prepare uh, smart city and mobility policy, the plans we should all reflect on uh, what former policies allowed current land use development and the disconnection of mobility and accessibility to equity for all socioeconomic groups. So a few questions I want to leave with you to think about as we walk through uh, our, our slides today with you is, is it possible to introduce fair capping for all transit users? and transition that to provide affordable access to other modes through a municipal account-based system. This is something that TriMet in Portland is beginning to do and explore and, and really uh, have some success in. And the second question is, is there an app ecosystem that is equitable and how can that uh, be maintained? So uh, using a holistic approach to transportation and land use integration for smart mobility uh, planning really begins with geography. Geography can provide insight into how data can play a role in which uh, who benefits from the smart city policy. Smart mobility must be imagined beyond the core business district and work with communities to prioritize their needs. Equitable smart city policy should enable smart mobility for disadvantaged communities and bridge gaps forged by those failures caused by former policies. As planners, engineers, and GIS professionals, we cannot allow policy to continue to create cultural and socioeconomic divides. So within the smart cities framework lie the key to smart mobility integration through a holistic integration with all divisions and departments of each jurisdiction. Beginning with policy, federal, state, and local, these will enable general and specific area plans, including transportation management plans, transit plans, to prescribe programming and funding of projects to advance these efforts. So there is a need to build off of the great work that the Federal Transit Administration is leading with the Mobility on Demand Sandbox and Integrated Mobility Innovation programs. This past February, the FTA released the mobility performance metrics uh, for integrated mobility and beyond. You know, to date, uh, current transportation metrics did not scrutinize who benefits from implemented projects. This new guidance from the FTA begins to implement applicable metrics to evaluate those mobility projects. So there's really four overlying goals of the uh, MPM or the mobility performance metrics. Those are for the traveler and this really analyzes and, and provides a metric of how individual travelers view their trip experience through five factors that affect transportation, efficiency, effectiveness, and experience. And that is the time that it takes to travel, their budget and how much it costs to travel, the reliability of that mode, the safety of that mode, and the availability or indoor frequency. Then the second goal is about the system and how the system-centric measures are, uh, are performance focused on that traveler itself. And then you get into a more broad and regional goal and measuring the impact of that transportation system at the regional level uh, 
And again, one more more broadened goal and at a national level, evaluating the impacts of all jurisdictions and regions collectively. So this uh, enables a framework to evaluate pilot projects and take an equitable approach to these performance metrics focused on the traveler themselves. So data must often be liberated from proprietary systems, open to the public, cleansed, standardized, and aligned to industry standard specifications. Few data specifications around smart mobility, and many of you are already familiar with GTFS, or the General Transit Feed Specification, GBFS, the General Bike Share Feed Specification, the most recent one, the MDS, and the Mobility Data Specification. There's a few others that um, you may not have heard of, like the building and land development specification. And this is, revolves around permitting of developments. Others uh, of great importance are OpenStreetMap and OSM. Uh, shared streets is a referencing system for those streets. Uh, shared right-of-way specification, which is really focused around a right-of-way database uh, to enable complete street development. There's a APDS, which is a parking data standard. And uh, for the future of pricing of facilities and corridors, the manage and toll lanes feed specification. Then there's forethought into what are some potential upcoming data specifications, such as curb or traffic management, AV infrastructure and process, and system safety. Something that came out very, uh, in March 2019 and drawn on their experience from Toronto, Sidewalks, Sidewalk Labs announced in Planning Magazine four key components of digital governance to help establish criteria in creating a smart mobility data management plan. And those four uh, key components are creating a civic data trust, publishing those standards, responsibly acting on uh, the data impact assessment and responsible data use guidelines. Those four key components really help establish uh, a good data management plan and ecosystem to support smart mobility. So the goal of Data Science Initiative at Fair and Peers is really to empower our internal staff and our clients to critically think about transportation and urban planning data and integration in an optimal uh, community-focused solution. So now David Wasserman will provide some examples of how spatial data can be used as part of transportation planning practice to guide smart decision making. Thank you, Marshall. One aspect of smart mobility is the ability to tell comprehensive narratives about transportation systems. That often means being able to talk about each mode of transportation, its role in the travel network, and what opportunities each can provide to users. Esri Story Maps provide a unique means to tell truly multimodal narratives where each mode or aspect of transport can have its own story told through data. In this example, we use Esri's GTFS network dataset tools, now built into ArcGIS Pro, to assess the accessibility to jobs and other amenities from specific neighborhoods in Vancouver, Washington. These tools enabled us to model what the reach of transit was by time of day and enable us to tell the story of job accessibility via transit from various locations around the city. Recently, we have leveraged these tools across a diversity of projects in combination with OpenStreetMap and network dataset templates in ArcGIS to drop the time that it takes to build truly multimodal network datasets from 24 hours to two hours. This is a result of high degrees of automation provided by ArcGIS's improved network analysis tools for, G, uh, for GTFS and ArcGIS Pro, um, but also as a result of network dataset templates, we can spend less time reviewing transit network configurations and the quality of GTFS datasets. Next slide, please. Another important uh, story is the one surrounding bicycle accessibility. In this case, we use a network metric known as level of traffic stress, an accepted metric of bicycle comfort. Using this metric, we can adjust the travel costs associated with network segments based on whether a user rides in a high stress segment or a low stress one. For these sheds, we assume that when they encounter a high stress segment, they will dismount and walk, but will bike at normal biking speeds on low stress segments. 
Using level of traffic stress, we can better understand gaps in access as a result of high stress facilities relative to the degree of travel that could be achieved using crow fly distances, as you, as you see in this map. Next slide, please. The last mode we will review from this example is also one of the most underappreciated, freight. Freight is so critical to the functioning of our cities. And when these systems are under strain, we all notice whether it's a distinct lack of toilet paper in the grocery store or your Amazon order of red tube socks being one month out, we all notice. This, this map provides a slider for users to quickly see uh, distinctions between truck vol uh, traffic volumes and the actual location of Vancouver, Washington's designated freight routes. The differences hit a hint at which roads might be worthy of design changes to better channel freight traffic to the desired routes. Our next example demonstrates the power of network analysis to test facilities across a region. The Mid-Valley Active Transportation Plan in Utah, being managed by the Wasatch Front Regional Council, leveraged ESRI's advanced network analysis libraries to evaluate the marginal access of multiple facilities. We start this analysis by looking at how many households can access a set of community amenities like schools, hospitals, parks, and shopping centers. And assuming riders dismount and walk on high stress segments and then bike normally on low stress segments, we evaluate their baseline accessibility to uh, the, the baseline accessibility to households from those destinations. Then we evaluate each proposed new active transportation facility in terms of how it improves access by assuming all segments underneath the proposed facility will become low stress in the future. Thus, in this diagrammatic example, the addition of the proposed facility led to 25% more households having access to this healthcare facility. We use Python to automate just such an analysis across 800 plus destinations for 110 corridors to be tested. This analysis thus required the generation of approximately 100,000 isochrones to facilitate, and isochrones are essentially polygons of reachability. The result of this process is how well each proposed active uh, transportation facility improves community access to each of several categories of destinations. Next slide, please. To illustrate what the results look like, we can look at a single destination the closest facility to it. In this case, we see a proposed facility on South Trail led to a 317% increase in households with access to Taylorville's town center after implementation. One of the benefits of prioritizing projects on access is not only the ability to provide a comprehensive assessment of an improvement to performance, but also the ability to identify which populations benefit. So equity can be directly integrated into prioritization processes rather than being an afterthought. This incremental gain in access can be used to scrutinize the demographics underneath it and to help identify who benefits from this improvement. Next slide, please. Other ways we can en enable smart mobility is simply developing a better understanding of what we have on the ground. Increasingly, this process of updating inventories of infrastructure assets is getting easier as a result of advances in computer vision, whether it is street level imagery or aerial imagery being used to find these infrastructure assets. For street level imagery, Mapillary provides a unique way to augment field work by acting as an AI assistant help identify signs, crosswalks, and other assets as part of transportation projects. With its recent Facebook acquisition, much of the commercial license technology is to become more available by use from DOTs, transit agencies, and other parties. For aerial imagery, Acopia Tech provides a unique option to extract vector GIS data of assets using high-resolution aerial imagery. On projects, we found them to be strong partners in providing cost-effective options when developing sidewalk and roadbed inventories across an entire city. This could be useful for identifying gaps in the pedestrian network with regard to access to transit stops. If you're interested in finding out more about computer vision and its role in planning, uh, we have an APA Technology Division recorded webinar that we can provide a link to if you're interested. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
Geography also provides us a means to prioritize siting and suitability based on a diversity of factors. But what if the factors and considerations change? In a world that feels like it's being defined by uncertainty and shifting tides, the ability to pivot our priorities based on data is critical. This EV charging uh, siting suitability map developed for Seattle DOT demonstrates how geoprocessing services can drive the dynamic evaluation of siting locations for EV chargers based on the intersection of data with our values. The value of being able to articulate these scenarios in the face of an uncertain future is an increasingly important part of the planning process and how we respond to change. Next slide, please. Finally, we can leverage geography to enable nationwide understanding of emerging trends. For example, this spatial analysis approximates the suitability of urbanized areas for shared micromobility services, considering land use and transportation factors, as well as entertainment, tourism, and education destinations. Cities may consult this national tool developed by Fair and Peers to better understand where private uh, for-profit operators may choose to expand and the policy implications for mobility, accessibility, and equity outcomes. In addition, as we see more and more shift towards the use of personally owned micromobility devices, we expect that the results of this analysis could be helpful in identifying the hotspots where they might be adopted more quickly. So in this, so quickly we'll review some of the examples across the United States. Right now we're looking at Boston but also we can look at another city, such as Chicago, and then another, such as San Francisco, and another, such as San Diego. And finally, on Los Angeles. And we can see just from these maps, uh, how there, the coverage of the areas that have high suitability vary extensively from city to city, but also the degree of connectedness between whether or not they are through connect, uh, cohesive and connected corridors is also apparent from these maps. Next slide, please. Now we will hear from Carrie Carcel about how we can make professional insights accessible by enabling users to test proposed projects in a uh, for development and evaluate how to mitigate their climate impacts in one app. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I'd like to introduce one of the latest applications that we helped create, which is the Santa Clara Countywide Vehicle Mat Miles Traveled Evaluation Tool. Um, first, I just wanna say thank you to Santa Clara County's Valley Transportation Authority, or VTA, for allowing us to share this application with you today. Um, an additional thank you to the Blue Raster and VRPA Technologies for being our partners in this endeavor. Next slide. So to talk deeper about this application, first I need to talk a bit about the policy that has driven it. Uh, California Senate Bill 743 was introduced as a statewide policy change for transportation impact analysis in the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. At its core, it changes the focus of transportation impact analysis from measuring impacts to drivers to measuring the impact of driving on the environment. Uh, this change is being made by replacing the traditional level of service with uh, vehicle miles traveled, which is VMT, uh, by providing streamlined review of land use and transportation projects to reduce future VMT growth and to better align transportation impact analysis and mitigation outcomes with the state's goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, encourage infill developments, and improve public health through more active transportation. Um, this represents a pretty major shift in the legislation and policy for smart cities. Guidance in the leg legislation was fairly general, and the details of the changes were in many ways left up to each jurisdiction to figure out for themselves. Um, for more information about 743, please uh, visit fairandpeers.com slash SB743. Next slide. So from the initial research, Fair and Peers worked with clients to determine how to navigate those changes and then created a replicable workflow to help guide agency staff through that flow. 
Um, lead agencies can make the decisions on the thresholds, comparison metrics, and other values that work best for their own jurisdiction. This VMT evaluation tool that I'm about to show is about automating that workflow under certain conditions. Next slide. So the VMT tool was designed to assist in potentially pre-screening new development and estimating project-generated VMT for certain types of land use projects. The tool also allows for mitigating the VMT generated by a project at the discretion of the jurisdiction where the project is based. The tool is entirely data-driven and utilizes Esri's enterprise systems for data storage and for geoprocessing tools. The configuration tables shown on the right enable the lead agency to modify settings for each jurisdiction based on the jurisdiction's internal policies around SB 743. Most of the VMT generated metrics come from the local agency's travel demand models, but other data sources may be utilized as well, depending on the local needs and the available information. Next slide. Besides the enterprise GIS framework, this application was also built using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript and utilizes the React UI component libraries. This JavaScript front end communicates with the configuration tables and geoprocessing scripts and allows for an easy to understand, straightforward user experience. <clears throat> the GIS configuration tables drive the available dropdowns for each of the jurisdictions. Um, by the way, I'm going to go through a live demo in a few minutes of the application, so bear with me a couple more minutes. The, um, the end user is able to review up to three different sets of VMT metric specifications at one time and can choose similar or disparate values on each of the dropdowns. What you're seeing here is the jurisdictional average for baseline selection, where a user can choose to measure their project's VMT against the city's um, city average, county average, or in this case, the Bay Area regional average. Next slide. The end user is able to enter in their own potential project land use allocations, like number of single family homes in the development, or 1,000 square feet of new office space. With this application, the user can test different project scenarios to understand the potential impacts on vehicle miles traveled. Next slide. The tool was also designed for attempting to cut down potential project impacts by introducing certain VMT reducing measures. Initially, all of the reduction strategies came from the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association, or CAPCOA's, Quantifying Greenhouse Gas Emissions Mitigation Measures document. It's <laughs> a lot of mouthful there. And they have been updated with new research as it becomes available. Um, each jurisdiction, again, can choose which reduction strategies work within their own guidelines and policies. Next slide. Because the application was built on the ESRI configuration tables, oops, sorry. I skipped a slide. <laughs> the complicated policies that each jurisdiction adopts and the technical calculations that go into the vehicle miles traveled analysis become transparent for everyone, and they're all delivered in a user-friendly application over the web. This slide is showing the simple, easy to understand report that generated that is generated and allows the end user to determine if their project would be passed within the jurisdiction's current guidelines or not. The circle you see there is pretty clear, yes, pass or no, fail. Okay, next slide. Because the application was built with the configuration tables, it's infinitely expandable to fit any size area, from a single city, like you see on the left, or to an entire county or more. This particular application, the Santa Clara Countywide VMT Evaluation Tool, covered roughly 490,000 parcels in 16 different jurisdictions, which included the unincorporated county area. This one application covered an area larger than Rhode Island. Now, um, we're going to go ahead and switch over to the live demo. If you want to make my screen presented, let me know when that's up. OK, I think that you should be seeing the tool now. So um, a couple of things I want to mention about the tool as well. We built it to be highly accessible for people with low vision deficiency or for those that require a keyboard rather than a mouse. So all of the navigation and tooltips are tab, you can tab through them 
or you can um, use your mouse and, and uh, walk through it. So uh, we also built in a whole lot of little tool tips that, um, you know, if anybody has questions, they can kind of hover over them or click on them to, uh, to open those up. So the first thing you do is choose which jurisdiction's rules you choose to follow. And then you zoom into an area and choose a parcel when it comes up. Um, you can choose multiple parcels if you'd like. The additional information on here is helping you to navigate or to uh, wayfind. It gives you, it shows you where the frequent bus stops are, the rail lines, rail stations. Um, if it is a person who uh, does not want to use a mouse or you already know your APN, you can also type in the APN here and it'll pop up a list of them of which you can choose. And do that at the moment though. The tool has a lot of instructions built into it. Um, you can give your project a name and a description and it shows you which APNs you chose in the first place. Then you, all, all of these drop downs are driven by the um, configurations tables. Um, you can have multiple models in a single application and you can have multiple analysis methodologies in a single application. This also allows you to choose uh, between the base year model and the future year model if your project is going to be um, built in a different year. Uh, again, you can choose up to three different VMT metric specifications and all of this is driven by what the jurisdiction wanted to be available for that land use. And then, again, you can enter in all of the information about your uh, project, single family, 100 units, 100,000 square feet of office, or whatever else you want to have in here. And then you can choose which VMT reduction strategies work in your city. If a jurisdiction chooses not to allow um, one of the reduction factors. So in this instance here, this city chose not to allow bike share programs. Um, it just becomes grayed out in the app. I'm going to put something in here so that we can see some differences. And then I'm actually going to jump over to this one that already has results. Um, the results take about 20 seconds and I figured I wouldn't make everybody wait. So this is the um, end result of the tool. It's a PDF report that has all of the information that the end user entered into the application. Um, it has a timestamp and all of the additional background information that is needed to submit this to the, um, the jurisdiction to get their project approved. Um, it also shows you how that set of parcels um, was evaluated within the um, structure that the jurisdiction set. So in this case, you can see that the VMT was reduced a little bit on each time um, and whether or not it passes the threshold allow, uh, allowance. Um, this also allows you to export the PDF or you can export the base data tables in the event that an end user wants to do some additional calculations on their own. And then finally, this allows any end user to sort of do some sensitivity testing and, and go back and forth. You can go edit your inputs and you know make your changes accordingly um, to do multiple analyses as much as you want. Um, I think that that is it. I'll pass it back over to Marshall. Thanks, Carrie. So I'm just going to briefly talk about a few next steps um, in what uh, smart mobility looks like in the future. And as Terry kind of prefaced uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and and I want to show you uh, something that's interesting. Uh, but before I get to that, 
uh, I wanted to show you a chart here that uh, is a result of the massive uh, national transit strike, but this is specifically in Paris, which occurred uh, in the beginning of December. And really this gets into mobility intelligence through data. And um, this data and, and report is from a European-based company called Fluxuo. And they're analyzing and taking a look at the micromobility in Paris. So as you can see, um, as transit uh, be essentially ceased to operate in its full capacity uh, due to the transit operator strike, there is a dramatic increase in the usage of uh, micromobility services around the city, and that proliferated and, and continued throughout the entire the duration of the strike, uh, which was uh, over uh, a period of um, 30 plus days. Second um, example I want to show you is uh, to the point of the coronavirus. And again, this is data out of Paris. Uh, showing at the end of the strict confinement period a uh, exponential increase in the use of micromobility devices. And, you know, this mobility intelligence through the data analysis is really enabling us to better understand usage of different modes of transport. Uh, the important piece of this is that the data needs to be shared and available for all modes. And it kind of begins to shape and shift the conversation about how data can be shared. And there are potential new policies out there in integrating a, a public-private partnership for data hosting and serving. And the development of data resources um, for example, the, the mobility data specification being coordinated by the Open Mobility Foundation, which is essentially led by a consortium of US-based cities and uh, allows the development of that new data standard to openly share this information, this data. And essentially, if, as we are analyzing and taking a look at how micromobility data is impacted by our current pandemic, it would be extremely helpful and useful to have uh, all of the same data available for all modes. So it's transit, we have uh, ride sharing and car sharing, uh, uh, individual single use auto and, and pulling all out of uh, traffic data out of, out of their, our traffic networks. So all this mobility intelligence through data will really allow us to have community focused planning policy that allows uh, insight through multimodal uh, mobility. At this time, I think I'll pass it back to Terry to um, feed some questions. Um, but here's our contact information if you'd like to reach out to uh, Carrie, David, or I, and also our, our LinkedIn contact. Okay, thanks, uh, Marshall and, and Kerry and, and David, uh, really uh, uh, sort of a whirlwind of uh, uh, examples and, and really, again, sort of emphasizing uh, the ability to use data and visualization and analysis together, together to better understand really uh, the, our changing mobility patterns. Um, go ahead and you can start uh, typing in your questions and we'll get to uh, as many as we can. And let's see, I'm going to start off and uh, can you, and Marshall, I don't know if this is you or if this is David, but um, or Carrie, uh, can you speak to maybe the ease of use of the GTFS tools in uh, the latest version of ArcGIS Pro? How easy were those to, uh, to use and, and uh, what was your experience with that? Sure, I, I, uh, it's all right, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I would say they are, there, there has been a massive uh, amount of progress on evaluating transit networks within ArcGIS Pro and, and making it quick to build these networks. Um, uh, th there are some examples of things that used to be very difficult to manage, such as um, 
GTFS stop times, for those unfamiliar uh, with GTFS specification, can allow you to have blank stop times um, in, in your data sets. And often uh, that, that requires uh, some interpolation to, to make work. And um, Melinda Morang at Esri has done an amazing job at curating these tools and um, making them so that the imports for GTFS before they're integrated into a network data set are automatically interpolated. And that, that I think, occurred as of 2.5. Um, and that, that, that feature itself has been in, incredibly useful in uh, streamlining your workflows. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks. So, um, and there's a question really back to the story map of Vancouver. And, and again, I, that was really a, a great example. Um, how does, you know, the analysis where you're looking mode by mode, um, how does that allow you sort of a, or how does that allow a planner really uh, to bring each of those together for really a more comprehensive uh, mobility planning so that, you know, you've, you've, you've done each of the analyses uh, individually and then, you know, how, um, how does that help facilitate really that, that comprehensive uh, mobility planning? If you could maybe speak a little bit to your experience on, on that. Sure. Um, I, I think when we work on uh, very large scale strategic plans or multimodal plans, um, the ability to use a web-based platform for everybody to engage in the same story is pretty critical in understanding um, and, industri and distributing a message. Um, about a plan and, and what's possible. And I, I think the just being able to go through tabs and, and see how different data sets um, are relevant to, to different parts of a system um, is, is, is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, we don't have an example of it here, but we have done, for example, we might have tabs um, Actually, we have a very great web map example uh, provided by, I think, Salt Lake City, um, where we develop on build on this concept known as layered networks, where we'll take all of these separate mode data sets, um, how they're prioritized and, and whether a segment um, should fit one um, type of classification or another. Um, and we'll bring all of that information together, evaluate how each mode is performing on a network level or a segment-based level uh, for every facility. And based on our modal priorities, we, we use that synthesis to, to bring together a layered network analysis. And while this map doesn't have that example, um, we've told similar stories of different modes of transportation in a, in a very similar way where we'll talk about the unique factors that influence each of them, but then try and use our uh, layered network um, approaches to build a synthesis to inform decision-making and concrete recommendations for every street um, that might be of interest to a agency. Right, and I one of the things that I have noticed is that increasingly cities, um, I guess as a way of trying to break down some of the traditional silos have started thinking about and even hiring mobility coordinators that how how do we sort of look across between transit between the road department between you know the metro and and how do we bring this together and how do we really sort of plan uh really sort of mobility much more comprehensively. And I think these are the types of tools that uh, really help facilitate that kind of comprehensive mobility planning. Um, I think uh, to also yeah. piggyback on, on what David was saying is, and, and what you just reiterated, Terry, the ability to, to look at the jurisdictional data at scale and uh, refocus your attention, whether it's at an intersection or a corridor, is really the power of this platform and the power of the data sets that are underlying in, in the analysis of all of it together. So. Yep, yeah, so, um, so on your power prioritization example, um, 
you know, it's really sort of a different understanding of, of equity and, and equity issues and and quite a bit different than the sort of traditional Title VI analysis. Uh, you know, can you maybe speak to that a little bit and kind of the really sort of the differences and the, the, the different types of, of equity analysis that that really opens up? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think I think one of the 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 key one of the key takeaways of, of this type of approach is more than an equity analysis. It's it's a way to tie together a planning process in in a way where um, stakeholders have a voice um, in in how it looks. So, for example, you can have community input help determine what destinations are important. For example, um, and and that can feed directly into how you do your analysis. Um, you can do things such as gauge um, what types of demographics um, people want to know about. Is it is it income? Um, is it getting to issues of race? And and those types of things, um, and and really scrutinize those factors explicitly based off of what what a community is interested in understanding. So it's it's a really flexible approach that aligns well with um, a, a participatory public planning process in, in, in a way that's data-driven, um, or, or I like to say data-informed more than data-driven, um, but also um, flexible enough to take into account what's important um, to the communities we're trying to serve. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a critical point that that really you know sort of transit planning, mobility planning um, varies community by community. Different communities have different values that they want to optimize, and I think that that's um, really sort of having the tools that allow that kind of flexibility is is really critical and and. Different communities are going to um, want to optimize different types of goals and may even define equity, you know, somewhat differently community by community. So, um, again, I, I think that's a really a, a, a different way of, of really approaching these issues and I think opens up a whole another set of, of, of opportunities or possibilities in terms of really the way that we, we look at mobility issues with within our within our communities so um, let's see um, so I know that you know you guys are actually working on uh, uh, a couple of other projects really relating to uh, I guess sort of the um, somewhat related to micro mobility somewhat related to uh, kind of the changing urban patterns um, and that's really sort of curb management I guess as, as uh, the uh, sidewalk and the curb has sort of become the uh, <laughs> hottest piece of real estate in most cities or do you guys uh, are you did you want to say anything about some of that work or do you want to save that for yeah I think uh, thanks Terry I think you know, we're we're actively working on a project with FHWA to identify a curb management tool, um, and would love to be able to share that with everybody um, later this year after it uh, has been tested and, and is is live and available. Um, but in a nutshell, we're we're looking at uh, how to assist jurisdictions in managing the the hottest real estate. In, in their space uh, at this point being the curb and the multi-use and multi-functionality that that curb exists in. Uh, so yeah, I would love to be able to share that later this year. Okay, yeah, and, and actually I've seen some of that and I, I will uh, uh, say it's, it's very, very impressive work that you guys are doing there. All right, so there's another question here um, and it really has to do I guess maybe sort of following on to my question about that comprehensive map and the the ability to comprehensively analyze mobility. The question is, as for transit, what might be the strategy that can accommodate reliability, capacity, or even curbside activities 
uh, which significantly affect the tendency of residents to take transit. So, uh, you know, I guess maybe beyond a little bit of just sort of the standard accessibility, what what uh, what are some of the things that transit agencies uh, can do to sort of uh, increase transit utilization and perhaps even in terms of some of our urban uh, urban design? Well, I, th I think uh, a big piece of this is if you're using this type of accessibility analysis and the prioritization, you're able to identify where you have uh, gaps and hindrances and, and um, you know, ineffective networks based off of uh, street coverage or, or uh, you know, facility coverage. But moreover, um, you know, kind of diving back into what the Federal Transit Administration has identified in, in how do how do we move forward and evaluate uh, from a traveler's perspective the um, metrics that will make transit moving forward successful and uh, conducive for more efficiency um, based off of uh, how long it takes for someone to travel, uh, what is their applicable budget, how reliable it is, how safe it is, and what is that frequency and availability. The It really is going to be hand in hand and, and focusing on those core metrics, those performance metrics of your system will help to identify where you have those gaps uh, within the system and then kind of leveraging and using an iterative process of redesigning systems through GTFS, uh, you're going to open up opportunities to really reevaluate um, how, how to map out your transit system. You know, a lot of it, it, it comes back to creating uh, more access to transit through higher frequency uh, of, of service. But, you know, the other side of that is, is how are those passenger facilities uh, being served, how is the information of the on-time performance being relayed to a customer? Um, are those systems available to folks that do not have uh, access to mobility applications via a smartphone? Are there kiosks? Are there other methods of providing that information uh, to travelers? Um, do you have the ability to uh, augment um, other mobility methods to serve uh, your constituents in, in different ways. In the middle of the day, somebody needs to, to attend a, a doctor's appointment, but it's going to take them an hour to use transit to get there, but it would be uh, 15, 20 minutes if they had opportunity to use um, an alternative mode. And are there opportunities to assist in creating a, a mobile uh, payment platform for that. And uh, these are some projects that are uh, being tested around the country um, starting this year through the, the, um, the integrated mobility innovation programs. Right, and and sometimes that falls under the rubric of mobility as a service, which which I think we sort of understand a little bit differently. And I think some of the initiatives in Europe have actually gone um, a little bit further, really, in terms of uh, looking at and investigating kind of that that future. That do we have one? one payment, one card that allows us to uh, exercise any uh, type of mobility uh, uh, available, whether it's in some cases it may be a car, it may be a, an Uber or a Lyft, it may be uh, uh, the train. Uh, and I know that uh, there, there's several experiments uh, in, in Europe uh, with that kind of a concept, but, but certainly I know that we're uh, testing some of those concepts uh, here in the in the states. You mentioned uh, TriMet, and uh, you. What do you see as sort of the future of that? And do you is that is that a way of sort of public transit agencies sort of reimagining or rethinking uh, kind of the types of services that they might offer? 
Yeah, it is. And, and part of it is the fare capping, as I mentioned earlier. And that's something that TriMed has brought to the United States. Um, you know, Transport for London kind of set the standard on fare capping. Uh, but, you know, addressing a lot of transit riders that may not have the ability to have uh, bank accounts and have the ability to um, purchase monthly passes with fare capping in establishing your own internal uh, architecture, system architecture, and, and, and uh, payment systems, uh, you allow for fair capping. And, um, you know, I think transitioning into allowing all of the participants and constituents to really think about transit empathy and not just about um, payment and mobile payment or um, you know, contactless payments as uh, we're seeing more over through through web apps. Um, but what are those passenger facilities like? How are those conducive for for um, providing information about the next arriving uh, vehicle? And how how uh, occupied is that vehicle? That's the next step. Is really liberating your passenger counting data in real time and, along with your other. Uh, you know, GTFS, uh, RT, or real-time information, and understanding uh, at capacity, especially today in the pandemic, how occupied is a transit vehicle? Is there going to be space for you on that vehicle, um, or are you going to be at risk? Um, and making sure that that information is readily available to folks with a mobile app and folks without a mobile app. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the, unfortunately the the you know COVID has has opened a whole set of uh, new considerations as well as some of the uh, uh, really sort of reconsideration of of equity issues and and uh, social issues that not only here in the in the U.S. but but literally worldwide. And and I think you know what I would say these are as difficult times as they are for for many public transit agencies, I also think they're very exciting times. I think we, you know, the the challenge is how do we take all these new data sources that we have available, and how how do we take and combine them with the tools, some of the the tools that that you've demonstrated and 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 others and and how do we do a better job of of really looking at and designing our our public transit services uh, for the future and i think that's really the challenge uh, before all of us so um anyway i unfortunately i think we've run out of time but uh Really, this was a uh, phenomenal uh, set of uh, presentations today. Uh, we really want to thank you, Marshall and Carrie and David. Uh, really outstanding work. And, and uh, so um, uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank everyone on the line. Um, you certainly can reach out to uh, to uh, any of uh, Marshall or David or Carrie. Uh, their, uh, their contact information is there. And uh, uh, you might want to flip the slide there. So, uh, and uh, so we hope to that you will join us uh, for future uh, uh, webinars in the series. And again, uh, we want to thank uh, all of you uh, 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 for attending today. So, with that, I'll close it off. And uh, thanks uh, for attending. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Yep. Thanks, Terry. Thank you.